104 this afternoon. That's all it's going to be. Psalm 133. I'll take that on 50 degrees any day. I'll take that and keep my mouth shut. Uh, I know I didn't go for everybody here. I know that. But uh, for me, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Um, I got chased by that ten dogs this morning. One night, I, I, I every now and then I see a dog, but I uh, was in South Houston, right, right at the limit line between South Houston and Houston, and uh, saw there nothing coming. I went straight through a stop sign, or I was going to get eaten up. I had two choices, and there were no cars coming. And no cops went on, thankfully, and I kept going. And uh, I avoided it. Um, when 11, 12, so years ago, I went on interview in Virginia. Family went with us. Priest that morning, he always took us to lunch that afternoon. And after lunch, the elders and I talked business, and the subject of salary came up. And I answered the question, like I always do, and I asked the question, what do you do to the guy, the last guy? And one of the elders' faces fell, and I knew I had hit a nerve. Joe said, Justin, we can't do what we did for the last guy. We had to let him go, and uh, he took about half the church with him. And we just can't do that amount anymore. Well, we continued to talk, and a couple weeks later, the church called and asked us to come, and the idols packed up and moved to Roanoke. And for the entire three years, I preached there. The entire three years. That split hung over that church like a black cloud. About a year into my tenure, and maybe not even one a year, the elders and I met with the leader in the group that had split and gone off one way. And with tears in his eyes, said he wanted to repent and do the right thing. And so that night, the elders asked me to stand before the congregation. It was a Sunday afternoon that we met. So on Sunday evening, I stood before the church and under the elders' direction, said that his brother had repented, and as a result, that two churches were now in full fellowship. Some people had a big problem with that. They were irate. Felt that elders left this dream of the law easily. For the next two years, there were days I would spend hours listening to people cry and moan and bellyache about how the elders handled the situation. One guy actually told me that the man who split the church could never, under any circumstances, be forgiven. Couldn't happen. Never. Under any circumstances, no matter what he did, no matter how much you repented, there was no forgiveness available for him. When you know, those who broke away were involved as wrong as could be. But so were those who refused to seek reconciliation and forgiveness. They were just as wrong. I pray that you've never been involved in a church today. They're nasty. They're ugly. Don't want anything to do with them. Maybe you have. Maybe you simply saw a split from afar, but your heart still breathed. 
maybe, maybe, there's a member of the church who doesn't like you very much, doesn't really like to speak to you, will happily go out of his or her way if he sees you in public to keep from having to speak to you. Maybe you're one of the Maybe there's someone in the church, this congregation or another congregation the body of Christ, with whom you have this flesh match. You have something against. You know, however, that the way of Jesus is the way of unity. Jesus, the night he was betrayed, prayed. John 17, 20 and 21. I do not ask for these only, the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that's us, that they may all be one. John says, you, Father, are me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Stop and think about that prayer of Jesus for this moment. The weight of all the world's sins are crashing on your shoulders. All of your sins. Sins at all. And let them go to God and bemoan his situation. Rather, he prays that his body, his church, be unified. The last hour before his crucifixion. Jesus is praying for a unified church. Let that sink in. With all of his heart, all of his turmoil, knowing all of us to come, his prayers for the church be unified. The text Randy read for us this morning written centuries before Jesus prayed that prayer. But David got the theme of Jesus' prayer. And he said this, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers well together in this. That's the message David presented in Psalm 1. <clears throat> David began the song. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Now, the idea of brothers dwelling together in unity occurs twice in the book of Genesis. And both times, brothers could not dwell together in unity. Abram and Lot, they had too many flocks, and their herdsmen were too many. And the text said, they could not dwell together unity. The same thing with Jacob and Esau. Their words were too many. And the text said that they could not dwell together because their flocks were too many. Now, if, presupposition, but if those Genesis texts stand behind Psalm 131, Psalm 133, 1, and I think they probably do. The idea in Psalm 133 is this. 
before God gave his people Canaan. They couldn't dwell together in unity because he had not blessed the land as principally as he promised. But you know in Canaan that promised land, God was going to give them bounty and bounty and bounty. They're going to have blessings to the Lord. And thus, in Psalm 133, verse 1, God is seen as fulfilling those promises, giving his people bountiful blessings. The title of this psalm says it is a psalm of a sense. That's Typically not important. I typically would not mention the title of Psalm in, in a sermon. But this is an exception. Because the Psalms of Sense, this section of the book of Psalms, were Psalms the children of Israel sang as a journey to Jerusalem to worship. The Psalms of Sense, Jerusalem was up on the hill. And so they were ascending toward Jerusalem, Psalms of Sense, and they sang these songs as they journeyed to Jerusalem to worship. Now, think about that for just a second. They are singing, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity in unison. The children of Israel are literally in unison, in unity, seen. How good and pleasant it is when brothers who have the unity. And doing so together in unity. Remind themselves of what a blessing God had given to them. Be able to dwell together as they were. In verse 2. The first of two similes in this song is like the precious oil on the head, rain down on the beard of the beard of Aaron, rain down on the collar of his robes. You know that special oil was poured on Aaron's head and taken apart by priests. And on his sons, and on all their descendants to sanctify them as priests in the service of God. That oil that consecrated Aaron and his successors is like the unity of partners. There's likely something also there about the aromatic smell, aroma of this oil. It would be greatly fragrant. Go back to the Old Testament and read what all went into it. Oh, it was now so good. Likely something about that smell. Brothers, well, and then the second symbol at verse 3 is like the do of Herman which falls on Mount Zion. Back then. Back then. You see, Hermon is a mountain in northern Israel. A great, big, snow-capped mountain. Zion, Jerusalem, is in the southern part of the nation. So, so how does do from the northern part of the country, this northern mountain, fall on Jerusalem? I ain't got the highest idea, to be honest with you. I don't know. But I know this. In the arid climate of Jerusalem, there's not a lot of rainfall. And so vegetation is largely watered through dew. It is part of God's blessing. And so God is seen here as blessing his people through the dew. 
because they don't get a great deal of money. You get that part of God's blessing here at the end of verse 3. For there, the Lord has commanded a blessing, life forevermore. God is blessing his people as they dwell in Jerusalem throughout all the world in unity. And God continues to expect his people to dwell in unity. Oh, behold, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Hmm. I have in my life seen more than my fair share of this disunity in the church. I've seen fights. I've seen victory. I've seen hatred. I've seen a whole bunch of sin regarding me. But God expects His to dwell in unity. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.10 I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. 2 Corinthians 13 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Ephesians 4 3. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. First Peter, reading. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Unity. Unity. You know, before we started this morning, this church was a picture of unity. People up out of seats talking and laughing and hugging and sharing life together. That's what God intended. For us to be family, to be unified, to be united. How can you play a part in that unity? How can we as a church continue to be unified? How, let me ask you this, can we grow in unity? How can we do better? And I don't know of any problems here with Mr. God at all. We've all got to be better. How can we be unified? Well, first, you have to think of adoration. Adoration. You see, adoration, worship, is a time when the church is literally unified together. This is a song of ascent. The ancient Israelites sang this song together as they journeyed together to Jerusalem where they would worship together. This song is not only about unity, but they sang it in unity. Now some might have sang like Jimmy and did way off key. I don't know. Okay? I said in front of you, so I know. Seriously. Seriously. They say it in unison. In unity. 
together. Worship is about being together. It is about being the church. Acts 2, 46 and 47. And day by day, the early church, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Acts 20. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered to gather the break bread, gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, continued to depart the next day and prolonged his speech until midnight. First Corinthians 11 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together, to eat the Lord's Supper in context. Wait for one another. When you come together. Now you sit at home and watch them on the couch. Now you've got too much other stuff going on and, and you know, we'll pull that stuff later. Not when I Got this or that or the other. When you come together. You know, hasn't Daryl been an example in the half? If a man can be here, you can be here. You can be mad what else is going on. How bad it hurts. That's where it's supposed to be. You know, there are times you can't make it. I miss the great deal myself away. There are times you cannot be here. I'm not here. We all know that. God himself knows that. But simply to miss this symbol, that's as unchristian as it can be. But the church comes together. We assemble. We worship. We honor God together. Think about what happens in worship. Think about it. We sing the same hymns to one another. You're singing to me, I'm singing to you. We take the word supper and use it together. We pray the same God. We hear the same message and the same word. We give to the same work. It's not just that we're in the same physical place, but we're sharing so much together. Together. Unity. How is your adoration? Your we have every time you can't be here. This is a habit. This is a priority. Are you seeking the unity of the body of Christ? The two, you need to check your attitude. You need to check your attitude. There is nothing, nothing that's going to harm the unity in the body of Christ more than that. More than a selfish, self-important attitude. Romans 12, 3. By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought 